everybody, my name is Elijah and I am a rising senior at Fisk University studying English with a minor in Women and Gender Studies who for the past two months has been hard at work here at NYU um, doing research. Um, and I just want to real quickly take this time to acknowledge this awesome opportunity that Lambie gave me. Uh, thank my wonderful cohort for supporting me and of course thank my mentor who without her I wouldn't be up here giving a worthy research project. Oh crap, what the hell? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which brings me to my presentation entitled Pixelating Rainbows, Examining the Effect of Queer Ambiguity in Children's Cartoons. So, before I actually, this is now it's supposed to be on the slide. Um, before I actually get, in, get into talking about what queer ambiguity is and how it is utilized in children's cartoons, I think it helps to first contextualize this conversation by briefly introducing or talking about the climate of children's media as it stands today. And so contemporary children's cartoons are shifting the paradigm of queer representation in children's media. And what has established or instituted that paradigm in the first place are attitudes of homophobia and heteronormativity that have pervaded the industry for a very long period of time. And perhaps marking the genesis of such are regulations such as the Motion Picture Production Code of 1930 or the Hayes Code, which imposed harsh regulations against the portrayal of queer or homosexual subjects in film, consequently marking homophobia as an intrinsic moral value of the media industry. And since then, this industrialized version of homophobia has evolved into what I call queer maturization in media, where queer subjects and queer life are considered unsuitable for childhood viewers. And that has also been perpetuated by newer regulations, such as the MPA, MPAA rating system, which is known for having a tendency to more harshly treat homosexuals sexuality versus heterosexuality in film. So it's with this that queerness has kind of been described as a contrary definition to what we consider, quote, appropriate children's media, uh, which I will get back to later. I don't know why I keep on changing slides. Anyway, contemporary um, cartoons such as Steven Universe exist as interventions to this definition of queerness as both a mature subject matter and as an identity that, identity that needs suppressing. But this is not to say that such marks a renaissance of queer representation in children's media where the depiction of queer identity is without contest or controversy. Cartoons are utilizing ways to subvert this, and my research looks at the ways in which cartoons intervene through queer ambiguity, which is pretty much the utilization of subtle expressions of queer sexuality and gender to represent the broader spectrum of the LGBT plus community as a whole. And I kind of want to focus on two things with this presentation. One, how characters in Steven Universe simultaneously represent multiple queer identities um, for its audiences, audience, thus being queer universalization, and also how ambiguity works as resistance to the industrial silencing of queer identity. Why does it keep doing that? Anyway, um, so looking at my first argument, the universalization of queerness within the show, we see this evident within the primary cast comprised of the self-proclaimed self-proclaimed crystal gems, characters such as Garnet, Amethyst, and Pearl um, belong to an alien species known as gems. And upon first glance, we notice that the gems appear to be represented as female characters. However, gender identity and consequently sexual identity, oh my gosh, <laughs> Um, becomes a complicated aspect of the gem existence when we take a closer look at how the concept of gender or lack thereof operates within the alien race. Um, so series creator Rebecca Sugar and others who work on the show, such as Ian Jones Corti, have asserted time and time again that the gem gems themselves, or the gem race itself, rather, is agender. However, as said and as previously shown, the gem race seems to be depicted as if they're women. Technically, as the show writers, um, like Sugar put it, there are no female gems. They're just gems. However, here lies an ambiguous inconsistency that's further complicated when we notice how gems are also referred to in the show with feminine pronouns. This indicates that although asserted as agender, um, the crystal gems are meant to be coded as female within the context of the show. But if that's the case, how then do we understand how and why the gem body exists as a contradiction to the way sugar may intend for them to be represented? So in finding the answers to this question, I came across a paper titled Steven Universe Fusion Magic in the Queer Cartoon Carnival Left by Eli Dunn, in which he theorizes that a gem body in Steven Universe is an arbitrary distinction that, instead of being what I call a contradiction to the ways I'm meant to be depicted, exists as a representation of the trans identity. Using the in-show description of the gem body as a, quote, illusion, Dunn argues that gender is performative, malleable, unfixed, and ever-changing. He makes the point using a bunch of different evidence, which I can't all explain today, but uh, one of the primary ways in which he evidences this principle is through um, ameth Crystal Gem Amethyst's prowess and shape-shifting as evidenced in this gif. When Amethyst enters the, quote, male form of the purple puma, even the pronouns used in reference to her are switched to masculine ones, and Dunn describes this gender fluidity as a representation of the trans identity. But I kind of want to take it a step further. Um, instead of arguing that the ambiguous, malleable, and fluid nature of the gym body instead ubiquitously represents um, 
crap, I'm so sorry. Uh, it represents the queer community as a whole, with trans identity being one simple shade in the massive, flamboyantly colorful universality of queerness. Um, still, um, even though I kind of disagree with this theorization, Eli Dunn's um, theorization is important, as um, his theory is just one in the entire Steven Universe fan discourse that evidences an awareness of queer ambiguity within the series. So Heather Clark in her thesis titled My Lesbian Space Rock Show examines the discourse on websites such as the Steven Universe subreddit, which I have the header pictured of right here, um, which common threads share a variety of interpretations, like the idea that the gem's gender is our own socially and culturally imposed categorizations onto the um, alien race, or even that the gems, despite having, having no gender, are choosing to identify as female. And additionally, she looks at what's called, quote, gender-bent fan art, where fans of the show reinterpret the so-called feminine representations of the gems as males. Here we see side-by-side -side artists offer cartoons, renditions of gems, char gem characters, Pearl, Ruby, and Sapphire, next to the official artwork who, in their male form, indicated androgyny and ambiguity in the gem body, further showing how open to interpretation the gems are within the series. And I can go on and on about the various other ways in which gym characters and even human characters in the series represent different, sometimes complex expressions of queerness. And the fact that there is such a discourse so large in the community exemplifies the effect of queer ambiguity in the series. Characters like the Crystal Gems are not represented inconsistently, as I said earlier, to allow for such a large discussion about their genders and sexualities. They're represented ambiguously to serve as, as a ubiquitous representation of the queer community, where even the coding of a character as agender and female can exist simultaneously without being a contradiction, as in the case of the Crystal Gems. Um, and uh, if you don't take my word for it, re when Rebecca Sugar was asked whether there would be transgender representation in the show, Sugar, who is a bisexual female, replied stating, I'm not going to read the whole quote, but um, it's very important to me that the show makes people feel represented. I want everyone to have a sh cartoon fantasy that they can relate to. So it's with this motive and imperative intention for Rebecca Sugar that Steven Universe exists as a resistance to the paradigm of children's media without diverse representation, which brings me to my second point about how it is resisting um, through its existence. So as said earlier, you have to um, contextualize the industry and talk about, you know, industrialized homophobia um, and queer maturization and heteronormativity. And I'm using big words to describe this, but pretty much all I'm saying is that censorship is prevalent and has been censoring the identity, the queer identity throughout, like, Forever. And this is important to take note about how this resist, um, how Steven Universe resisted, because um, censorship allows Steven Universe to exist. As Hender, Heather Hendershot explains in her book Saturday Morning Censors, censorship is a social process that both prohibits and produces meanings. And what is meant by this quotation is that censorship should not be seen as a, quote, reified prohibitory force, but rather a dynamic productive force that generates and reveals the same cultural fears which we try to hide. Which, um, these cultural fears are supported by statistical data. In 1993, a New York Times um, poll concluded that more than half of people would not permit their child to watch a primetime TV comedy with gay characters. And you fast forward um, over 20 years later to 2015, where a variety survey has shown that things just haven't changed, with only 50% of the public being okay with LGBT stories and kids shows. Which, going back to what I called queer maturization earlier, this kind of exemplifies that principle because they feel like it's unsuitable for childhood viewers. And, but that's just kind of like the homophobia aspect to it. And looking at how pervasive heteronormativity is in the industry, Martin and Kazik's 2009 study t entitled Heteroromantic Love, Heterosexiness in Children's G-Rated Films concludes that heteronormativity remains as prevalent, prevalent as ever, proving that 75% of the highest growth and grossing um, children's films of all times use heteroromanticism as a driving plot point, among other interesting t statistics about heterocentric sexiness and objectivity. So these are the kind of things that Rebecca Sugar and consequently Steven Universe are responding to. The show not only challenges what is meant by quote appropriate children's media that half of audiences feel like queer stories don't belong to, um, but also only exists because such a pressure has been put in place in the industry in the first place. And this is to say that the age and their ambiguous identity of characters like the Crystal Gems is methodologically used as a way to circumvent and equate quite dexterously censorship. When you look at shows like Star vs. the Force is Evil or Clarence, they're mirrored by controversy because unlike Steven Universe, queerness isn't as ambiguous from an industrial context. In essence, their ambiguity is kind of like a Na 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 boo boo, you can't do anything about it to the network and to the industry. And once again, if you don't take my word for it, <laughs> the Steven Universe fan base itself exemplifies an awareness of how this queer ambiguity works from an industrial perspective, as pictured here in a comic created 
um, by a fan in which the personified version of Cartoon Network busts in on Rebecca Sugar like, what is this? And so this is kind of all to say with my presentation that queer ambiguity works as a method through which cartoon creators like Rebecca Sugar imbue the discourse of queerness within its audience, universalize queerness for its audience, and just simply resist the powers that suppress it um, in the first place. And going forward, I think that this research is important in understanding how queer representation works in children's media today. Um, as far as I know, you're not hearing the words gay, lesbian, or transgender on children's TV, and it's quite possible that we might not hear it for a long period of time. Um, and while shows like Steven Universe are making a notable effort, I think it helps to look at other shows that are doing the same thing, their methods of resistance as well, and of course, exactly how these methods, including what I call queer ambiguity in this presentation, affect the childhood viewer and the queer, the queer child. Um, so, yeah, thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you.